And I want to introduce our wonderful speaker today, Anna. Let me, Anna, let me make sure I pronounced your name correctly. You said I did when I met you in Pittsburgh, but Anna Volishina. 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 Vol Volishina. Is that right? Yeah. Close. And uh, I met uh, Anna, and, and, and I'm, I'm Scott Warner, by the way, president and program chair of the Culinary Historians of Chicago. And I met Anna, uh, it was in May, wasn't it? It se seems like yesterday, but it was in May in I Pittsburgh. think it was out of uh, April. April, wow. And April seems like yesterday at the International Association of Culinary Professionals annual conference that was held in beautiful Pittsburgh this year. I never thought Pittsburgh was gonna be beautiful and it's what a beautiful city and uh, with beautiful people attending the conference like Anna and uh, somebody at, at our table when we were having dinner during the conference introduced me to her and said, Anna has just written a book about uh, Ukraine food. And I said, what? And uh, Anna uh, has lived in the US with her husband for 11 years. They're from Kiev. And Anna is a, a cooking teacher. She's a food blogger. She's uh, a, a chef, you're a trained professional chef too, right? Yep. And, uh, and I said, you wrote a book about Ukraine. And, um, you know, I, I know, I know she was kind of holding back tears then. And so was I talking to her just the what was going on then and still is going on. And right away, I said, uh, could you talk to our group? Uh, and the soonest, op the earliest opening I had was this month, I actually didn't have this month, this month was booked and I asked our speaker for this month who's gonna talk on sourdough history next month, Eric Pallant. Uh, I said, could you sh could you shift for us so we can get this, this uh, very timely poignant topic in right now? And he said, sure. So Anna is gonna talk about her, her book, her family history and her own feelings about what's happening now. Uh, Anna's book is Budmo a Recipe, and I don't have the title in front, Recipes from Ukrainian Kitchen, is that right? Yep. And uh, beautiful recipes. In our, in our notice that we sent to you, there are links to some of her favorite recipes from the book. And warning, here's a warning, if you do open the links, uh, you better have something ready to eat handy or make the recipes because they're, they're drool-worthy recipes. Uh, and, uh, and also, if you do want to order the book, uh, you know, you can order from wherever you want. We gave two links. One link is to Rizzoli, Rizzoli uh, Books, who's, published the, who's publishing the book. Uh, if, you, if the book will come out in September, if you pre-order it, 10% uh, of the proceeds of the profits will go to you, the Ukraine fund to help fund what's going on, to help Ukrainians. And of course, we gave an Amazon link. But uh, with with all that in mind, um, I, I would so love to hear your story about this wonderful food and what what what's well what's going on now. Let, and Anna, take the stage is yours. Thank you so much, uh, so much, Scott. Uh, I'm very uh, excited to be here. I'm excited to share uh, my story and. Uh, the information about Ukrainian cuisine and uh, Ukraine itself and Ukrainian food takes uh, one of the leading roles in Ukrainian culture and uh, I will tell you why um, and hopefully you will learn something new today and this is a, such a broad topic but I'm I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share uh, to share it with you. So I was lucky to be born and raised in Ukraine. I was born in the southern part of Ukraine. Uh, okay, <laughs> it will be a little bit emotional just because of everything that's going on. So my part of Ukraine is, um, you, uh, is in between Kherson and Mykolaiv, which is a very small, small, tiny city called Snyhorivka. And right now it's not Ukraine anymore uh, because Russian army occupied my hometown. And any, any day we're waiting for Ukrainian army to come and take the city back. It's not happening at this moment. We're waiting, my, my family left uh, the city. I couldn't 
like I couldn't convince them to leave for a long, long time. And my whole family just stayed in our root cellar for weeks, just hiding from bombs. And um, uh, this is a very interesting moment because my whole family uh, worked like years and years to fill those um, roots uh, cellar shelves with preserves and uh, homegrown produce and homemade wine and sauerkraut. And uh, they never relied on those produce to sustain themselves. It was more for pleasure and just indulgence. And when the war came to Ukraine, they, they relied on those preserves to sustain themselves, which was heartbreaking for me. And just even think about that. But um, I'm glad they had that food. Uh, and uh, that's why preserving is so, so, so important. And it's a key thing in Ukrainian culinary culture. Uh, and okay, I will tell you a little bit about the history of Ukraine and uh, location. And uh, part of that is, uh, will give you a better understanding of what's happening right now. So Ukraine uh, is the second largest country in Europe, and uh, it's lying in between Western Europe, Russia, and Asia, and it's both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is we are very close to the European culture, to European countries, and the curse is we're very close to Russia and uh, all of those like big countries, big uh, powerhouses always try to occupy Ukraine, rule and like throughout the history uh in the 13th century uh ukraine was uh occupied by mongols and then it was uh polish lithuanian commonwealth and uh austrian hungary and then ottoman empire and then russian sardom and finally was ussr and here here we are uh in our free independent ukraine again fighting for our freedom and for our culture. And a lot of invasions happened in Ukraine throughout the history. Uh, and uh, every culture left its mark on Ukrainian cuisine. So we have, we share a lot of common dishes with uh, Poland, with uh, even with Turkey, which is amazing because I, I really, really enjoy those types of cuisines. And it's kind of, uh, unexpected to find those type of food in Ukraine, but if you look throughout the history, uh, we had very tight connections with those uh, countries. So of course we have the um, the le leftover recipes and dishes from the time we encountered those cultures. So the name Ukraine comes from the word "cry," uh, which means um, not, not crying, but a piece of land or the borderland. Uh, that's why it's called Ukraina uh, in um, Russia and Ukraina in Ukraine. So uh, Ukraine lies mostly on a flat surface with lots and lots of steps. Um, step is like uh, the majority of the country and my part of uh, the country, the southern Ukraine has lots of those fields and the land uh, is very, very fruitful. Uh, the soil called Chernozem, and it's incredibly fertile. So you just put a stick and it will grow beautiful, uh, in a beautiful tree. So that was one of the reasons um, a lot of countries were interested in getting a piece of Ukraine, just because they could grow anything there. And from uh, the time of uh, Russian Tsardom, uh, Ukraine started, uh, got, got the name of uh, breadbasket of uh, Europe. And uh, to this day, we grow uh, a lot of wheat and rye and barley and uh, other grains, uh, and we distribute them throughout the world. But at the time when the um, it was the beginning of uh, 20th century, 90% of all grains that were uh, imported by um, Russian empire was from Ukraine. So it's very interesting. And even fun fact that uh, one of the oldest uh, Canadian uh, grains, which called uh, Red Fife, uh, was uh, traced back to Ukraine. Uh, and the name of that grain is Halichanka, which is very, very hearty 
amazing grain, ancient grain. Uh, so as you can guess, in Ukraine, uh, grains are a staple. And before uh, we got our loved, <laughs> beloved potato, uh, grains were just like uh, the foundation of Ukrainian cuisine. And we fermented them. We made a bunch of kashas. By the way, you probably already know, but kasha, uh, it's any type of cooked grain. Uh, in Ukraine and in Russia, we call them uh, kasha. If you cook like rice, that's rice kasha. If you cook barley, that's barley kasha. Whereas in the United States, mainly barley is called kasha, uh, not barley, but uh, buckwheat called kasha. In Ukraine, any type of cooked grains, uh, cooked kasha, cold kasha. So um, after we got uh, encounter with the potato and cabbage and uh, uh, eggplants, they became like our beloved staples. And uh, especially uh, in the Southern Ukraine, we grew a lot of that. And uh, a potato is like probably number one crop uh, and it can be found in any single dish, <laughs> like, for, like not anything, every single, but pretty much like 90% of dishes. And every time you have this beautiful feast um, or just like bountiful dinner, potato will be uh, at least uh, like in 50% of the dishes and definitely one of the centerpieces will be some type of cooked potato, whether it's mashed potato or boiled potato or roasted potato. But um, it's, it, we like, we love it so much, but we didn't know uh, of potato until uh, late um, uh, 19th century just because it was not there, just it was broad and um, we brought it and grew it as a flower. Uh, it was like uh, a part of our decoration, same as sunflower. And only that, uh, that after like years and years of growing it as a decorative plant, uh, people started to eat it. And um, the same with sunflower, we never used sunflower oil as a primary cooking oil. But now it's number one. It's the only oil uh, I grew up eating. Uh, olive oil came much, much later. And that's because Ukraine was a part of USSR and nobody could share, um, could trade with other countries because no free trade and stuff like that. So um, we, of course, had and still have a very um, turmoil and close but complicated relationships with Russia. And uh, it very much impacted our food culture and culinary culture. And right now this war is happening and it's not only for our freedom, but for our uh, culturally, cultural independence and the right to uh, live and uh, develop our culture as we want it, and not as we've been told by other countries for many, many, many years. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, traditional Ukrainian um, flavors and uh, where they are coming from. So uh, Ukraine never uh, was never big on spices ever, just because it was never a rich country and uh, uh, spices were very expensive. So most of the dishes are uh, flavored with fresh herbs and garlic, salt and pepper. That's it. We use some dried spices, but they came much, much later. And uh, Ukrainian food is not spicy at all. Uh, the spices, uh, spiciness comes from red chili. And, but still, uh, when I came to the United States, I couldn't handle the heat just because my palate was not accustomed to that. And uh, I think the spiciest uh, food I, I ever had in Ukraine was uh, horseradish uh, in some shape or form because we use horseradish a lot in our cooking as a condiment or as a flavoring agent for vodka or our braises and stews. But uh, since it has such a powerful presence, we cannot use a lot of it. So there is not a lot of heat. So traditionally, uh, Ukraine um, relied on um, homegrown uh, country uh, produce. So um, we 
never had this experience with exotic fruits. Uh, the climate of Ukraine is mild, uh, but we have all four seasons. So the winter can, can be very cold and the summer is pretty hot. That's why we're very big on preserving stuff uh, because we had uh, our first fridge, I think, uh, arrived in like uh, late 70s or mid 70s. And everybody uh, had to ferment and preserve food uh, to just sustain themselves through winter. Uh, and uh, especially after the USSR came, uh, the way the economic uh, economics were planned, uh, there was always a shortage of uh, produce. So people, almost every family, and I think I'm the first generation who uh, actually <laughs> stopped, stopped doing that. Every family had a land, uh, whether near the house or outside of the city, where they can grow their own produce. And every single family would spend weekends there just like grooming, trimming, planting, and uh, harvesting. So uh, I grew up uh, this way, my grandma and my parents, they had uh, houses and with every house we had vegetable garden and fruit garden. So most of the food uh, we either grew ourselves or we would just go to a local bazaar and buy stuff there. So uh, when I was growing up, it was right after the USSR collapsed and we started getting some uh, supermarkets and uh, large uh, grocery stores. But before that, um, the economics was in such a bad shape that people would stand uh, hours and hours in line to get the produce and the produce was not good. So the only way to get good stuff was uh, to go to a local bazaar and it's easy in the village, but was pretty hard to do in large cities. So, um, to this day, uh, my mom would go every weekend, she would go to a local farmer's market because she knows everyone there. She knows where to buy her milk. She built these relationships with the, uh, with the local producers. And it's not even farmers per se. It's like small households that, that have like five pigs and uh, like one cow. So it's very, very small, very local. And I only started to appreciate this when I came here to the, uh, and started living in the United States, I realized the, how, how much the quality of those produce depended on the people and uh, the food itself was so, so, so delicious. And it's hard to find uh, the same quality here because of mass production and things started changing in Ukraine as, as well towards like mass producing food and transporting it throughout, like across the country. But um, when my grandma was my age, uh, like honestly, even food did not travel even in, in Ukraine. They would just grow their local stuff and eat the local produce. And if uh, the Western part of Ukraine didn't have eggplants, they just didn't have it. That's it. They couldn't grow them there and they didn't know how to use them. And uh, my grandma, she, when she went uh, to the Western part of Ukraine for the first time, she brought uh, eggplants with her and people didn't know how, to, and it was like seventies. So people didn't know how to cook them. Uh, so they made, uh, they thought they can make a drink out of them and just tr started boiling and nothing came out of that. So my grandma had to teach um, the way how we cook eggplants in southern part of Ukraine. So uh, it's just like 50 years ago and food did not travel at all. So right now, since Ukraine beca became independent and uh, became open to the world, we uh, embraced this globalization and embraced uh, the diversity of food in different cuisines. And now we have a lot of different restaurants and cuisine and we celebrate them and try incorporating uh, those types of food in Ukraine. Uh, and at some point it was so popular to uh, like pick up different cuisines that we uh, really went into Georgian cuisine. And we had more Georgian restaurants than Ukrainian restaurants in the country, which is silly. 
Uh, but I think uh, things are changing now dr dramatically because of the war and because of uh, the things that happened with Crimea, the annexation of Crimea uh, in 2014, people uh, became more aware of our own culture and our own legacy and started digging out uh, like this uh, old Ukrainian recipes and started to trace back the uh, culinary culture because since the USSR, it changed so much that we lost uh, a lot of recipes. And uh, when USSR came, they tried to erase all of the culinary cultures of all of the republics. But since Ukraine was so rebellious and independent, uh, it got the hardest uh, hit just because by uh, changing the way people live their lives will change uh, the generations that come after. So I will talk about that a little more. Uh, but um, yes, so the geographical location and history uh, very much um, shaped our uh, cuisine. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, our preservation methods because it's probably the biggest part of Ukrainian cuisine. And um, we have uh, a few methods and we use them all, uh, some more, some less, but still it's it's a huge part of our modern cuisine as well. So we, um, to preserve food, we dehydrate, smoke, cure, ferment and uh, pickle. And uh, to this day, a lot of the dishes uh, just say, uh, have this uh, the same preparation methods as they had before that. And I'm very proud that people uh, could um, preserve that as well. So uh, we are very big on curing everything and especially uh, pork fat, which is, um, which called salo. And this is one of our uh, cultural heritages and uh, culinary uh, treasures. So it's wonderful um, piece of uh, pork uh, back fat and it's cured in salt sometimes uh, just plain salt, most of the time it's just plain salt. Sometimes it's salt, bay leaf, and a little bit of garlic and black pepper. And uh, after it's cured, it's sliced very, very thinly and served with uh, uh, this wonderful rye bread and a little bit of horseradish. And uh, I think during every single uh, celebration in my family, we had that, uh, we had that salo on the table. And ev almost every family makes their own cured uh, salo, which uh, still amazes me because uh, I feel like my generation does not cook as much as the previous generation, but salo has like, survived. Everybody's uh, making salo, which is cool. And um, uh, the general name for that um, cured meats and, and fish, it's solinha. Uh, and uh, with the fish, it's basically the same thing. You just... Um, First, you will cure it with salt and then you will dehydrate it. Uh, and the, it's very, very simple. You would just uh, hang it uh, in a kind of controlled climate conditions and will dry. It's kind of nobody controls anything in Ukraine. It's very much uh, in, the cooking is uh, intuitive and uh, like by touch, by smell. Uh, nothing is measured. I've never seen a measuring cup in my entire life in Ukraine. Nobody uses scale or anything. It's very much um, a lot of passion and um, very much intuitive process. So uh, that's what I love about Ukrainian food as well. It's just a lot of uh, creativity and just like you make the recipe on the go and I, when I wrote my cookbook, it was very hard to collect family recipes because nobody ever writes things down. So I had to sit down with everyone and talk with them and like, okay, walk me through that. And um, it was a fun project and like reconnecting with family and asking them, it was just a, a very much uh, joyful, joyful quality time with them. So another uh, type of preservation we use in Ukraine is smoking. And um, what's special about Ukrainian uh, smoking is that we smoke not only fish and um, meat and poultry, we also uh, smoke 
uh, fruits, especially uh, prunes. Our prunes are very smoky, very delicious, and it, they're used to flavor stews and uh, braises, as well as um, we just cook them for a long, long, long time and we stuff them in, uh, into dumplings, which is amazing. And I couldn't find the same prunes here. And um, for probably I will start making them myself. I just need to figure out uh, the method, but uh, this remarkable flavor is just so uh, nostalgic for me and I cannot recreate the stews I grew up eating just because I cannot find the same prunes. And um, also another big, uh, big thing is uh, smoked pears, uh, which we use in, uh, to flavor our borscht. And uh, it's not as common in uh, the southern part of Ukraine, but it's very common in western part and uh, um, in the um, northern part of Ukraine, which is amazing. Uh, and the other big, big, big thing is our pickling and fermentation. And uh, I grew up among people who would pickle their uh, everything like honestly they would pickle everything that grows under the sun just because um, that's how they were taught uh, since the they knew what what famine is so my um, my husband's grandma she survived uh, Holodomor which was uh, created by USSR government to kind of uh, conquer Ukrainian people just to show them that we will, if you will behave this way, we will just uh, stop giving you food. And this is the weirdest thing in the world because Ukraine always produce uh, more food uh, for the whole uh, USSR for every single Republic than they produced for Ukraine. And at the same, at the same time, they could just take it away from people and just leave them there and let them starve just because they thought uh, that will uh, tame them. Uh, and uh, that's why the generation of uh, my great grandma and uh, like older grandparents, they remembered that and they taught their kids to preserve everything. And that's why to this day, the root cellar culture is so big and uh, in the uh, villages and the small uh, towns in Ukraine, because people remember that. And thanks to this um, mentality of preservation, we still have the methods and recipes and uh, this culture saved because otherwise, uh, it would not survive in large cities just because people don't do the same stuff there. They don't have the ability to store uh, their food in wood cellar or grow their own food uh, on their backyards. So uh, pickling and preserving uh, is very, very, very big. And uh, some of the recipes, uh, I have a bunch of uh, preserves in my cookbook and uh, I I wanted to include more, but of course you can have only so many. And uh, I have some sauerkraut and uh, pickled tomatoes and cucumbers. And I think uh, they're the biggest staples, especially tomatoes and cucumbers, just because um, we use them as condiments with for our drinks. Um, we call them the zakuska. And when you have a shot of vodka, you want to chase it with something tangy and um, interesting that uh, that will just um, uh, complement the flavor of vodka. And um, in Ukraine, we think that pickles and uh, all uh, stuff uh, like fizzy and um, tangy goes uh, very well with vodka, um, which I agree. I don't drink much of vodka, but I like eating uh, sour cucumbers with uh, like, mashed potato and some uh, pork crust. So it's something that uh, everyone in Ukraine do. And we, uh, growing up, we just um, understand those flavors very well because we eat them since the childhood. And another big part of growing up in Ukraine was that I always knew where the food is coming from. So like uh, here it was very strange for me 
that um, kids or like even adults, they don't eat uh, rabbits just because it uh, associates with like something cartoonish and it's like, oh, it's a bunny. It's so sweet and nice. And of course it's like furry and nice and sweet, but uh, in Ukraine, it's kind of food. And if you have bunnies at home, you don't play with them. You grow them and then uh, you just slaughter them and eat them. And the same with chickens and ducks. And uh, my grandma, she always had um, like pigs and ducks and chickens. And uh, of course, I knew that when times come, that will be our dinner. Um, and uh, that's why I honestly uh, very, very grateful for those experiences that I know uh, where the food is coming from. And uh, in Ukraine, we eat every part of the animal from nose to tail. Um, nothing is left uh, behind. We, we cook everything. And uh, I think that's the part of the mentality of like scarcity that like you need to utilize everything you have uh, because you need to respect uh, it's because Ukrainians not always had abundance of everything just because we were uh, ruled by other countries and um, famine was a real, real thing in Ukraine, unfortunately. I wanted to finish this part of like pickling and preserving stuff uh, by talking about Ukrainian bazaar, which is farmer's market. Uh, and it happened usually uh, on weekends. And uh, as a young kid, I would love, always love to go there with my mom. And uh, as I told you before, she knew everyone there. So she like handpicked everything and um, you can taste everything there. You can uh, ask people like, oh, okay, where, when you made this cheese or like, uh, like everything. You could ask any questions and people would reply. You can taste anything. And the one of the most important parts, you need to bargain for everything. It's like, even if it's a bunch of cilantro, you need to like bargain. If it's like dollar and 50 cents, you need to bargain to get 50 cents off. And this is a big part of the culture uh negotiating the price and my mom and grandma they, they they're amazing at that i never learned that well i cannot use it here in the united states my mom came here and she um goes to buy some strawberries and she would negotiate the price it's like it's in her blood which is funny but it's a it's a very cultural thing in ukraine and it's like it's fun for uh the the seller and the buyer it's like this cultural exchange uh which is fun uh so uh i'm also um considering myself lucky to know that like i should ask where my food is coming from because like i saw my mom doing that and i know that like how to grow uh, some potatoes because we need that and um uh, it's i think that what shaped me as a cook and uh, that what gave me this um, interest in uh, different cuisines and different um, recipes just because I love uh, cooking stuff that I can grow myself which is yeah which is very very fun and um, uh, we're moving to um, re regional cuisines in Ukraine so Ukraine is a large country and uh, since it was under uh, different influences, uh, most of the like the Western part was always more European, uh, more uh, closely related to European countries. And if you would go there, you will see it uh, with your naked eyes. The food is a little more sophisticated and you can find different recipes like strudel and um, uh different uh, like borax and stuff like that which you cannot find in the eastern part of ukraine eastern part was um it's very close to russia so basically the whole eastern part is uh, one large border with the uh, russian federation which now is a very very uh, difficult subject because uh those um, regions are getting like the worst time of their lives because Russia constantly bombards and attacks everyone but we'll talk about that a little later 
uh, but those types of um, recipes are very, very resembling of what people had in the USSR. Uh, but if you will travel uh, from east to west, you will progressively see more European recipes, European uh, cafes and bakeries. And there is nothing like, the, right now it's more, but uh, let's say 20 years ago, there were nothing like that uh, in the Eastern part, just because it was like very much uh, under Russian influence. And uh, let's say uh, in uh, the Southern part of Ukraine, where I'm coming from, we had, uh, of course, always the biggest um, fields and the biggest, uh, the, the largest amounts of land to grow, to grow stuff. And uh, we are very big on tomatoes, uh, eggplants, watermelons. So basically all of the orchard fruits and uh, vegetables are grown in that part of the region, close to Odessa, Mykolaiv and Kherson. That's why uh, we rely on those uh, produce on our day, uh, in our da daily um, menus and uh, the recipes are very veggie forward. Although we use a lot, a lot of pork in Ukraine. Historically, uh, I try to understand why pork is so big in Ukraine and it's not as big in other countries. And uh, I found a few explanations. And uh, the one that um, Ukrainian researchers uh, lean towards to is that because uh, at some point, Ukraine became a very um, large producer of distilled uh, alcohol, like vodka, and we call it horilka in Ukraine. Uh, people use the byproduct of um, distilleries to feed pigs, and they would gain a lot of weight, and it was quickly. So uh, it was very convenient for them to grow uh, pigs, uh, whether... Um, Beef was never the main meat. We mostly uh, have dairy cows. And uh, I, when I was growing up, I, I rarely eat beef at all, just because all of the cows were like milk cows. And uh, the meat, after their lifespan, the meat is not as delicious. And uh, it's very expensive to grow beef, like steak, uh, beef for steaks. Uh, and Ukraine never did that. But we are very big on poultry, uh, which is chicken and ducks. Oh my God, we, my grandma always had ducks. And uh, so duck is our family, uh, roasted duck is our family uh, dish, which is present on every single um, uh, holiday. And whether it's a birthday or religious holiday or whatever that is, the duck, my grandma's duck is always there and I don't remember if I shared her recipe with you I hope I did if not you know where to find it it's in my cookbook it's one of my favorite recipes of all times uh, and it's it's absolutely delicious uh, and uh, also of course uh, Ukraine we all have our different regional dishes but we have the staples like borscht and uh, kovbasa kovbasa it's like uh, kill it's not like Polish kielbasa, but it's one of the variations. And kovbasa, most of the time, it's made uh, at home uh, and it's very, very finely minced. And uh, then it's roasted or uh, lightly smoked and uh, it's stuffed with uh, pork and uh, different spices, nuts, um, like um, nutmeg and um, clove and garlic. And I think this, this is it. Oh, yes, we have duck. Yay. I'm so happy that I included that recipe. Uh, I think this is my favorite dish of all time. Like when people ask me, I think they don't expect uh, to this to respond. They expect like borscht or vareniki. But duck is my number one, uh, my number one dish. And uh, we also have... Um, Holupti. Holupti is uh, cabbage rolls, uh, which are very big uh, in Ukraine. We like different regions have different recipes, but every single uh, region makes holupti because it's like one of the staples as well. And uh, 
Uh, and one fun fact that um, we have these dumplings, which are called vareniki, and uh, they call vareniki in southern region, central Ukraine, northern Ukraine, and eastern Ukraine. But in western Ukraine, you can um, find them uh, as pierogies. And uh, this is a fun thing because I, when I was growing up, I never heard the name pierogi. And in Ukraine, uh, in Mykolaiv or Snihurivka, if you hear the word pierogi, it, it means a totally different dish. So if you will order pierogi in uh, central Ukraine, you will get uh, this yeasted, wonderful fried pastry, which is completely different from these dumplings. It's not even a dumpling. Uh, and um, in uh, the Western part, it means both the, this pastry and uh, dumplings. Um, and I tried to trace the roots uh, of pierogies and like whether it's Polish or Ukrainian. And I found one Polish uh, professor uh, of food history and he said he doesn't know. <laughs> so uh, I, I was hoping to find my answer, but he said like, whatever, we can share that. And I agree that pierogies are very, very delicious. So we can uh, both claim them as our national dishes. Uh, the only difference between, uh, the, the only big difference in vareniki and pierogies is that vareniki are boiled. We never fry our vareniki the first day. Uh, so we, uh, vareniki, uh, the word variti is, means to boil. So Vareniki literally boiled dumplings. Uh, and we fry them only the next day when we want to reheat them. And it's, uh, it's not even necessary, uh, but that's the only way we can eat fried um, vareniki. But in uh, Poland, I know that they fry them like the first day or like deep fry them. And I never had deep fried uh, vareniki until I came here. And I think it was like a year or two years ago uh, in New York. So uh, it was very, very um, big revelation to me that like, okay, we never had that in Ukraine. Uh, but other than that, uh, they are very similar. Uh, we usually eat them with um, some sort of um, topping and always sour cream. And we eat them with sweet or savory fillings. And if it's savory, usually we top it with uh, like thinly sliced uh, crispy pork belly. Uh, or um, we're, most of the time we eat it with uh, fried onion or like stewed onions. Uh, and that's it. We never, I, at least I never encountered uh, fried kielbasa on top of vareniki. It's not very Ukrainian, I think it's more Polish and never bacon. Uh, I think we mostly use pork belly for everything and uh, never in a form of bacon though. And um, as I, you might already get from uh, my uh, talk that Ukraine is very, very big on celebration and like food takes the, the biggest part in that uh, because we share our love and like express our love by feeding people and of course when we gather our family we want to feed everyone and um, a lot of our feasts are revolving around uh, religious holidays for example christmas and easter and a lot of other holidays but i think christmas and easter are the biggest holidays and i would love to share some um, menus from uh, our um, family feasts and Christmas uh, always requires 12 dishes and it has this religious meaning that um, it, like even uh, a drink will consider will be considered as a, a one of the 12 dishes but it needs to be uzvar uh, which is like uh, dried fruits that are boiled with sugar and uh, the drink is very uh, intense and beautiful uh, lightly sweetened and very uh, like um, deep amber color and it's one of the traditional dishes that needs to be on the table another one is kutya which is sweet porridge and it's also uh, has this religious meaning that uh, everyone needs to take a bite of kutya and it uh, 
uh, it symbolizes prosperity because it's made with uh, some sort of grains. It can be rice or barley or uh, millet, but some sort of grain and uh, always flavored with this uzbar drink and dried fruits and honey. So it like it symbolizes the good harvest and uh, like in general, it's like it's very, very um, good luck to eat one uh, tablespoon of kutya. And then uh, people just put their empty spoons uh, in, with this bowl of uh, leftover kutya and the dish is uh, staying at the table until uh, even sometimes the next morning uh, for our ancestors, for them to kind of enjoy this um, kutya and share it with us. Um, so it's it's very uh, symbolic, and uh, I think every family makes kutya on Christmas. Uh, other than that, we always have some sort of uh, soup on the table, and uh, during Christmas, most of the time, it's uh, vegetarian borscht or mushroom soup, very often with barley, and it's it's very delicious. Uh, and some sort of bread needs to be on the table, mostly homemade bread or um, or rye bread or um, uh, some sort of uh, dinner rolls. And I included the recipe of pampushki as well. Uh, and borscht and pampushki just like match made in heaven always goes go together. And we rarely eat this pampushki with any other type of soup, just with borscht. So if you have this borscht on the Christmas table, you need to make pampushki as well. Uh, other than that, we always have some sort of like uh, roasted fish or fried fish. And most of the time it's whole fish, not uh, fillets, uh, which I love a lot. And uh, here it's not as common. And when I cooked this large uh, roasted fish for the first time for my guests, they're like, oh, are you not going to like, filet or like do something like no my family does not do that now of course after going to cooking school I do that but um it was never a thing in um in Ukraine it would just be whole fish and you would just like, take a piece and that's it nobody cared about bones and stuff uh, of course, vareniki should be on the table, uh, some sort of uh, beet and walnut salad, which is uh, very common in uh, every region of Ukraine. Uh, then ferments, of course, sour uh, cucumbers and sauerkraut or preserved mushrooms. Um, then uh, deruni, uh, which are basically potato pancakes, aka latkas. Uh, and I've never heard of the name latka. Uh, until I came here, of course, and I always thought it's like traditionally Ukrainian dish, and now I know that it's uh, the international one. Uh, but uh, we always uh, have it on our um... uh, and put, of course, potato in any shape or form, stewed. Like we make potato stews uh, with meat and prunes, we make uh, mashed potatoes, and like it's always at the table, no matter the holiday or like the cause of the celebration we have potato because it's like such a staple uh and now potato plays leading role grains are not as big uh in ukraine anymore only for like baking and bread and stuff but and for everyday cooking but not for holiday cooking except for this uh kutya which is very um uh symbolic and um I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening right now and what's uh, what is the cause of that. Uh, it's it's very emotional for me, and uh, I would like I think everyone in Ukraine, almost everyone, my parents for sure, were so glad that Ukraine became independent and finally could uh, just do like go towards Europe and be with our European community and not uh, going back to the USSR and Russia. So right now what's happening, and I'm talking about like, from the perspective of uh, my family and myself, that we are battling for our future, whether we're going to be with Europe or with Russia. And Russia is going back to USSR so fast, it's, it, it's frightening. And um, 
the worst part is that they are using food and uh, and grains and like this uh, as a weapon against Ukraine once again uh, in last like 100 years ago almost 100 years ago they used it uh, to create this horrible famine in Ukraine and pulled Holodomor and right now they are blocking 20 million tons of uh, wheat and grains uh, and it's not only bad for Ukraine it's bad for the whole world just because Russia wants to manipulate other countries by uh, blackmailing them and like we, we will create this uh, unstable situation for everyone in the world and or uh, you will just lift the sanctions and we will allow Ukraine to uh, export um, grains but the th um, the thing is uh, they already stole um, half a million tons of uh, grains and uh, Ukraine forbid uh, to sell it just because it, it means people who will buy it will support this form of terrorism which is horrible and um, like knowing from my family my grandma they talk to people who are still in um, our city that farmers cannot sell their food and uh, Russians will let it rather rot than let Ukrainian people have it so they cannot so our land is land of farmers and they make a living by selling this produce all over Ukraine and to other countries and right now they cannot do that and uh, they like the prices of, for food is so high in every single region in Ukraine but uh, southern Ukraine has so much produce and they cannot sell it and they are not allowed to sell it and this form of terrorism is like continuous throughout the years and they used it before and they're using it right now which is horrible and uh, of course, uh, nobody will lift the sanctions and uh, that, that will not work. So I don't know how this crisis will resolve, will be resolved. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. And I'm, I'm just hoping that um, Ukraine will win uh, as soon as possible because I have no doubt that Ukraine will win because it's like the battle against darkness and light. And uh, we're fighting for our freedom and we're fighting for our home. We did not go to russia and like attacked it no russia came to us so i think there's the only one solution we need to win but when nobody knows and um, since nobody knows this crisis will only get darker and deeper and i think by the end of the year we'll see horrible um, repercussions so this is it i'm Oh my God, I have so much to talk about, but I will uh, let you ask questions and just answer uh, everything you want to know about Ukraine. So there is, by the way, a uh, Ukrainian church uh, in the Chicago area. I think it approaches a cathedral in size and everything. They have a weekly sale of what they call pierogies because we do have a large Polish population here, but it's also Vredeki. Well, somebody did uh, ask, by the way, uh, about the um, process of smoking prunes and pears. Okay, yes. So, um, is that the, something you're learning the, or something you know? I'm something learning about? that. I know, I know that uh, how it was done before. We had this huge, um, the, uh, I don't remember the name in um, English, it's called uh, peach, which is basically clay or brick ovens. And they would slowly uh, smoke in that in those ovens, and uh, the uh, wood that usually uh, is used is cherry mm. or apple wood, and they would just slowly, slowly smoke in those uh, large brick ovens, and uh, then they would let uh, they will just be outside to dry, and they would not be completely dry, dry, but they will be a little drier than the regular prune you um, you know. Um, yeah, so it's like basically in this large, large brick ovens. I don't know how they do it right now because uh, I know that 
uh, I think people stopped smoking prunes uh, in their houses years ago, years ago, because nobody, like some people still have this ovens in their um, homes, but it's not as common anymore. I think most of the people just they go and buy uh, those like mass produced. But I know that a lot of Ukrainian chefs are rediscovering Ukrainian cuisine again, and they start recreating those methods uh, in their kitchens, in their restaurants. But Anna, um, it, over the years, there have been so many ways of waves of immigrants coming to America. And as a result, so many of the immigrants opened up restaurants. So we were exposed to all kinds of food, Hungarian food and Chinese food, you know, and just on and on. But uh, I don't think there are too many Ukrainian immigrants coming to the U.S. now. Is that right? Well, uh, we have a large community here. Not a lot of people open their own restaurants. That's the yeah. thing. And I've been asked a lot, like, why there are not uh, a lot of Ukrainian restaurants. And that was because people knew Russian food and it was easier to do Russian food than Ukrainian food because nobody knew what the heck Ukrainian food is. And right now there is a lot, a lot of interest to uh, our country and to our culture. And I think this is a great opportunity for people to start opening uh, Ukrainian restaurants. And I know that a lot of people working towards that goal right now. Uh, so hopefully <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but yeah, it's not that common for Ukrainians to open restaurants i it's not in our culture i know that uh like chinese they come uh here and they they open restaurants it's uh, like cooking food is something that is um for them like, it's not the easy way but it's like something familiar and they can do here for ukrainians for some reason they don't do that they would rather like i know a lot of people here uh, like my age and very few of them cook at home which is very strange to me because mm -hmm. i grew I grew up cooking all of like eating good food and like I wanted to replicate those and like I learned the recipes and I wanted to feed my family but in my generation and especially people who uh, come here in um, in the Bay Area they come as a like young professionals in tech they don't cook and you you did a pop-up dinners and you trained as a chef but like what what did you train uh to, to what kind of training did you have? What, what did you learn to cook? And what do you cook? What do you do at your pop-up dinners? So uh, I went to um, San Francisco cook, uh, cooking school, uh, which was last year. And uh, I started hosting my pop-ups way before that. And I wanted to cook traditional Ukrainian dishes mm -hmm. with uh, some um, little, little bit uh, of like um, Californian, soul because i wanted to use local um produce uh, and i connected with local farms just to um showcase like that we can eat very very uh, i don't like this word authentic but it's kind of like what is is very traditional ukrainian food uh and it doesn't matter that we are halfway across the globe uh it's still possible and i wanted to uh, share my um, culinary heritage with other people here and uh, I love doing that and we already have another pop-up uh, we in July and it will be a fundraiser for uh, World Central Kitchen which is the most amazing organization and uh, we uh, my publisher donates 10% from my cookbook pre-sale to World Central Kitchen and the thing, uh, the reason we chose uh, this organization is because it was one of the first organizations who came to Ukraine when the war started. I think in, in two days they were there and they were feeding people. Uh, they were feeding uh, people on the borders and in major cities. And even now, my friends sending me photos like, "Oh, my mom just got a meal kit from uh, the World Central Kitchen, and thank you for supporting them." So that's why I think it's very important to donate to those kind of organizations. And if you want to support, uh, follow me on Instagram. I always post different fundraisers and we are in the process of creating our own uh, small foundation because we have this connection with the different Ukrainian. Um, it's not like the whole army, but like um, 
I don't know how to call it in English. So we, we uh, help soldiers with provision and medicine. So we um, gather money, we do cooking classes, online workshops, or uh, bake sales and whatever we can do. And we just uh, buy medical supply and send that to Ukraine. Or sometimes we buy boots or helmets or whatever they request. So we get money. Uh, we either buy it here or send it to our people in Ukraine and they purchase it there. And uh, so this is the, one of the ways you can get involved. But uh, please follow hashtag cook for Ukraine. And this hashtag is uh, now like around the world and you can tune in and uh, a lot of different uh, awesome chefs host workshops. They get their money and they will let you know what charity they support so you can choose and uh, help. What uh, what kind of uh, of uh, oh gosh uh, can can you say something about the the recipes that you did include? I mean, you've already mentioned some of them, what they mean to you, and also could you um, just hold up a, if if you have your book handy? Could you hold it up if you have it handy? So I I don't have it yet, so uh, I will get it in a couple oh, of weeks. Right. It's still in print, so they're rushing to get. Uh, to get it um, to bookstores as soon as possible, uh, and they moved the deadline, so they're working hard. But I don't, I still don't have. I will get my copy like a couple of weeks before everybody else, so it's not like that much in advance. Unfortunately, I am dying to see it. But the recipes I included are very. Um, I wanted to represent the. Um, my part of the uh, country and uh, overall I wanted to showcase the most prominent recipes from Ukraine and of course borscht needs to be there because it's such an amazing dish and it's such a big part of our culture and this is a vegetarian version. In my cookbook I have three borscht recipes and they are all very much different. One is vegetarian red borscht, Another one is very hot pink cold borscht called holodnik, which is also vegetarian. And we eat it during like our uh, hot summer months. And the other one is with meat and it's green borscht, uh, we, which is very common in Ukraine as well, especially in the Western part. And it's made with sorrel and uh, fresh um, uh, spinach. And we top it usually with uh, egg either hard boiled chopped egg or like this uh, soft boiled egg is in my cookbook. And I, of course, if I included borscht, I had to include um, pampushki uh, because they go together always. And uh, I highly recommend you to eat the borscht uh, with the dollop of sour cream. And then I included my grandma's roasted duck recipe because it's very, very special. And if you want to cook something like a showstopper, that would be the dish. And the other one, I wanted to show you, um, showcase one drink. And I have uh, a few in my cookbook, but I wanted, uh, since it's a summer season, I have this uh, rhubarb and uh, strawberry kisel, which is, um, can be either, like if you use your cornstarch as in the recipe, it will be a drink. If you will use more, it can be like uh, eating with a spoon, which is also common. So it's both a drink and a dessert. Uh, depending on how much cornstarch uh, you're using. So I wanted to uh, add something that uh, can be very seasonal and enjoy it right away. Thank you. And, and Kathy, uh, could you do your impeccable job of, of uh, translating the, the chat questions or conveying them? Okay. So um, Eden said, I'm wondering what was eaten as a starch in Ukraine before the introduction of potatoes? Would it have been turnips or something else? Turnips, yes, we ate that. Uh, parsnip as well. Um, I know uh, we were always big on uh, beets, so it's not very starchy, but like beets are our like number one root veggie after potato. And uh, mostly it was grains lots and lots and lots of grains and kasha. Uh, not a lot of meat, surprisingly. Uh, right now, like we have very meat-centric cuisine. Uh, before uh, 20th century, it was mostly uh, vegetarian because meat was very expensive. 
uh, no refrigeration. So most of the time it was cured or smoked and uh, stored uh, somewhere like in a dark, cool place. But uh, you can only have uh, like so many uh, like this cured stuff. So most of the time it was kasha and bread. Uh, like bread still has like this uh, huge influence on Ukrainian cuisine, like and all uh, the uh bread uh br bready things um carbs are like large in ukraine so vareniki uh piroshki uh bread bread was eaten with every single meal because it was like filling and uh people could just easily get a slice and go work in the field so like most of the time was um was like that and like root vegetables like turnip parsnip bits and cabbage of course i got a question you said you brought up bread uh because i remember during the soviet era when bread was greatly subsidized you know you could buy a loaf of black bread for what 10 15 kopecks but you could yep. buy cookies for a whole lot more money and people because it was so cheap people sort of didn't respect it. I would say it had to be very fresh bread or it was old bread and they didn't necessarily want it. Is that same behavior today? Uh, so right now we have a bread renaissance in Ukraine, which I'm very happy about. So we, uh, before the USSR, we did a lot of sourdough. And when the USSR came, everything got very standardized and uh, the sourdough bread culture just died. Uh, because only like people in villages uh, could continue baking those types of breads. Other than that, it was like large mass-produced bricks of not very good bread. And uh, right now it's not like that. People are making gluten-free bread and sourdough is everywhere in Ukraine. And especially right now, uh, people are baking bread um, uh, not only to sustain themselves and just like uh, give it to our soldiers because a lot of bakers just started getting uh, fundraisers and to bake bread uh, and deliver it to our soldiers or to other uh, parts of Ukraine where people are starving right now because this is the real thing. Uh, Russia is blocking uh, food trucks and like food cannot go in so they try to deliver those homemade bread to Ukraine but it's not only a meaning of like sustaining and eating but also an act of uh, this like goodness and like making bread is very very special for everyone it's, it's very laborious and as you know the bread is alive I think it has this meaning of like sharing and supporting uh, each other by making bread for other people people so yeah right now we uh, we have like a bunch of different um, artisanal uh, bakeries and it's it's a very new movement I think it's like 10-15 years old only but it's it's growing and I'm, I'm very happy to see it but it and I think you were answering to Jacqueline which is great um, but I am interested if it's not absolutely fresh bread will you still eat it because that's what mm. I saw the behavior some years ago. Oh, and absolutely, absolutely yes. We will eat it. We will uh, dry it. Like uh, in Ukraine, uh, you are not allowed to throw bread away. Like this is not like something you never do. So we respect bread. And even uh, like when I was growing up, when I was little, if I would drop a piece of bread, my grandma, my great grandma would say like, oh, just like kiss it or like apologize. Because um, my great grandma, she remembered the whole of the war where there were no food at all. So bread uh, always had this sacred meaning. And it's it's a large part of, part of uh, our religious holidays so nobody will ever throw bread away so if it's stale you make croutons you make your uh like whatever you use it or eat it that's it and no complaints by the way it was noted that chicago has the second largest ukrainian community in the united states i know i know i i cannot wait to go um i hopefully will have some events um uh, this fall 
and I cannot wait to go there and just like present my book and talk to people and hear their stories as well. And you'll let us know because there's people here that would like to come to your uh, book signing. I will, I will. Um, okay, well, uh, perhaps this is more of a comment, but she, said she never, I never considered how food can be used as a weapon during conflict. I hope your people come on top of this. Me too. Yeah, right now it's, it's horrible, especially for um, people who grew up with uh, among farmers. This is so heartbreaking to see because I know how hard they work. And at this point they cannot sell their food. And um, I grew up with, like my parents taught me to respect not only bread, but all kinds of food and uh, seeing this horrible waste and uh, horrible behavior. Uh, it's heartbreaking. Everything is heartbreaking, but this is something like next level evil for me. Oh yeah. Uh, let me just, there's, there's stuff kind of moving very fast at the moment. There's a coalition that's going to try to run the Russian blockade to the Ukrainian grain. Oh, to the Ukrainian grain in harbor storage. So let's hope they're lucky. Uh, I, yeah, so, oh, I, I read about that. I follow uh, the news and uh, at this point it's very, very dangerous and other countries need to provide uh, the security ships to just uh, go with the, those ships with cranes because there are tons of mines in the city, uh, in the sea, and it's very dangerous uh, at this point. And even uh, like every week, uh, Odessa or like some other port city will uh, find this mine on the beach or like uh, recently a guy went to swim and he um, encountered a mine and he died. So it's very, very dangerous to go there right now. So it requires special equipment that will just like move the mines away. I don't know what, what that called, but I read that there is, a, there is something like that that will just like protect the other ships. And uh, we need that, but Russia does not allow other uh, countries to intervene intervene so we'll um, see somebody made the interesting observation uh my grandmother from Lvov area would make the sign of a cross on the back of the bread before slicing and serving to family uh yeah this is this is something uh people do we have a lot of different uh traditions um when it comes to bread we always serve it with a little bit of salt as a sign of hospitality people will uh, like this do crop like it's like a blessing for uh, that she gives to her family with this cross. So uh, Brad is like uh, is one of the most respected uh, foods in Ukraine. Are there any more questions? I see uh, Penelope. Oh, is Penelope! Raising hand. All right, Penelope. You are a wonderful spokesperson for Ukraine. Um, you truly are, and. Uh, you know, I found myself smiling even when you were telling terrible things that are happening because of, of a rapport that you established with who you're speaking to, which is quite remarkable on Zoom. Anyway, you are doing your country a great service by doing that. And I've already ordered your book, which I understand Thank you will, so be, much. will be um, delivered sometime in September. It's, um, <laughs> so I have one quick question and one just something that would interest me. But the quick question is, I of course Googled you and I come up with a synchronized swimmer from Ukraine. Is oh, that not you? me. You, <laughs> no. you don't look unalike. You don't look unalike. No, 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 it's not me. You're not you. Okay. People nope. change what they do in life. Um, and she the actually thing, lives in the United States. <laughs> does she really? As well. oh, yeah. Oh, oh, one other thing I just wanted to say is that because we do have such a large Ukrainian population and and things like churches, Ukrainian churches here, beautiful ones. I've been, I was given a personal tour of, of, of one and it was quite remarkable. Um, so if you go up to Ukrainian village, um, anyone who's in Chicago, but because of that, we will undoubtedly get a, a large uh, number of refugees moving to Chicago. So there will be places, there will be ways right. for Chicago to help directly with people who come here. Um, so, but the question I wanted to ask you is, you know, our big holiday 
is Thanksgiving. And one of the lovely things about Thanksgiving is that there are no Thanksgiving police. No, you, there, you, you generally a turkey has its symbolism and is recommended, but after that, it's up for grabs. So people who consider a rice dish to be the ultimate festive dish will have that with their Thanksgiving turkey. I'm told that Italian Americans have two dinners, one which is profoundly Italian and the other which is a New England dish. So I'm curious as to what goes on your Thanksgiving table. Uh, here, uh, we yeah. don't have Thanksgiving in, in Ukraine. Here, no, I didn't know. It's an American holiday, but you live here. <laughs> and what do you what so, do you choose to put on your Thanksgiving, your Ukrainian American table? I go very traditional. I always cook turkey, but uh, I think two, this, uh, two years because of the pandemic, we did not celebrate. So one uh, year I did all veggie Thanksgiving and last year I made um, chicken, but those are exceptions. So I usually have uh, this traditional roasted turkey and I try different recipes every year. But I always put some kind of mushrooms uh, on the table just because mm -hmm. uh, we always have mushrooms um, in Ukraine. And I would just uh, fry them with some onion and butter and garlic. Or I will make, uh, of course, potato, some sort of like potato dish. Uh, but uh, probably because of my husband, uh, I, tend, I lean towards uh, mashed potato more because he loves mashed potato. And I... I kind of tolerate it. Like I, I like mashed potato, but I would love to try like as many uh, different uh, variations uh, of other potato dishes, but he always requests uh, mashed potato. So it's always on the table as well. And sometimes if I want to cook something else, I would do like uh, potato, mushroom, and like prunes too, which is oh. not the same as in Ukraine because prunes are not the same. And uh, if I'm lucky enough, my mom was, would smuggle some prunes from Ukraine for me, and that would be on the table as well. And um, other than dessert? that, I think dessert. Oh, dessert! Yes, of course. Uh, desserts are always American, very traditional pies. Like pecan pies. Uh, pie is one of my favorite and I would make that and I would make some uh, homemade ice cream. So I'm mm. not like, I always go very traditional with Ukrainian holidays and uh, I always stick to American recipes uh, when it comes to Thanksgiving. Interesting. Is your husband Ukrainian as well? Yes. And he still likes mashed potatoes. Oh my God. Yes. He <laughs> would eat it every day. <laughs> So um, okay. you've been, okay. you've been, you've been, you've been wonderful. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, excellent. And we have a question now from Marini. Um, He's in New York. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. And I was wondering when you were going to do a book event in New York, because there are lots, as um, someone said, the most uh, Ukrainians are in New York. Hopefully I will do it. Like uh, we are working right now on our schedule for all the cookbook events uh, in fall. And uh, I, once I will have my dates, I will share them with you and I would love to see you in person. Oh, that would be nice. Thank you. So Thank we'll you. keep everybody up to date, at least the Midwest Chicago version of your, and, and I'll, 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 I'll if you let me know, I can. I know how to find Marini. I can let her know what's going on in New York. Scott, I think Wonderful. it's time for you to wind things up. But thank you so much. And I do look forward to meeting you. I have met you. So I look forward to meeting you, seeing you again when you come to Chicago. And uh, and good luck with your book. And let's pray for, for the future, for everything. And, and thank, thank you, you so, so much. Very, thank you. Thank so you. Very. I hope to see you in person very soon. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. I had a blast and uh, you're you are such a wonderful audience. Thank you for letting me share my culture and uh, some of my recipes with you. And now you can go back and rest in it because I, I didn't mention, but I guess maybe people read, but you're, you're broadcasting from San Francisco right now. So, uh, so enjoy that beautiful place and we will see you soon. Thank you, bye. Good night.